Hi and welcome back to Sansamed. And I should also welcome you to the endocrinology section. Now in this video, what we'll talk about is the endocrine system, the types of transmissions it carries out, the hormones and their mode of action, the different glands that takes part, their functions and components, and we'll also touch on the feedback loops that exist. Now, what is endocrinology? Well, endocrinology simply means the study of hormones. So the endocrine system is essentially a network of glands that works to maintain normal body function. You could see it as the brain's way to try to convey information to the rest of the body, much like the nervous system. But in contrast to it, it is very slow to initiate. However, it has a prolonged action. So what does endocrine really mean? Well, endo means within and crine means secrete. So an endocrine gland will secrete directly into the bloodstream. This is in contrast to an exocrine gland, which will secrete into a duct. So endocrine, more vascular or highly vascular, I should say, and ductless. And exocrine glands use ducts. So they have a lot of ducts and they don't need to be as uh, vascular as the endocrine glands. So a few examples could be, for instance, the salivary glands, the sweat glands, or the mucosal glands in the GI. Now there is also juxtacrine secretion. Now in juxtacrine secretion, you will require a physical connection between the two cells to transmit the information or the stimuli. So let's say that this cell will produce a growth factor or cytokine or chemokine then it would put it on its cell surface as a ligand and the other cell would then bind through its receptor directly. So this is a direct physical connection. Autoquine means that the same cell would produce a substance that it would use itself. So let's say for instance that this is a T cell that's going through monoclonal expansion and it's, it wants to become activated. So it produces interleukin-2, then the interleukin-2 produced would then come back to the same cell and be used by the cell, and that would lead to an upregulation. Now there is also paracrine secretion, paracrine meaning nearby secretion. So let's say that this cell is producing growth factors, or more often we think of clotting factors. So let's say you have a scar or an injury and you're bleeding you need to produce clotting factor to produce a hemostatic plug. So this cell is producing that uh, clotting factors and is used by close by cells. Now, what are these hormones, these chemical messengers used by the endocrine system? Well, they could be, for instance, peptide hormones, or they could be lipid derived hormones or monoamines. So what are peptide hormones then? Well, as the name suggests, peptide means amino acid. So this could be further subdivided into small peptide sequences, uh, such as TRH, ADH, or larger peptide sequences enough to form a protein. And this could be, for instance, insulin or growth hormone, or they could be a complex with a sugar, so to form a glycoprotein. This could be, for instance, in FSH or LH or TSH. And their mode of action, like in the case here with secretin, which is a polypeptide, would be that they could not diffuse through the lipid bilayer, so they have to bind to a receptor on the cell surface of the cell that they are having their effect on. Now, when it comes to monoamines, we have an amino group that is compounded with an aromatic amino acid. Now, the aromatic amino acids could be, for instance, phenylalanine, it could be tyrosine or tryptophan. So these are aromatic amino acids. In the case of histidine, we will form histamine. Now, histamine has an effect in local immune responses, so to increase the permeability for the white blood cells. Or it could be a production from tyrosine amino acids, so to form catecholamines. This could be in the case of dopamine, adrenaline and noradrenaline. These are stress hormones, so they would act to increase blood pressure and heart rate and so on. Dopamine, as you know, it takes part in our reward system, so it's released to make us more happy in a sense. Tryptamines come off tryptophan, which is the amino acid, and these would produce serotonin. Now remember another name for serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine, shortened 5-HT. And this is also important in well-being and happiness. And melatonin, which takes part in our circadian cycle, so regulates sleep and awakeness and so on. And their mode of action is, as in the case of epinephrine, remember epinephrine was a catecholamine that came off the, yes, tyrosine. 
and uh, it too just like the polypeptides are not lipid soluble so it, need, it requires a receptor on the cell surface because it cannot cross the lipid bilayer now the last group on our list will be lipid derived hormones these could be uh, either steroid hormones such as testosterone which is the male sex hormone or it could be cortisol, which is very important for glucose regulation and has anti-inflammatory functions. And so these steroid hormones will uh, be made from cholesterol. And then you have eicosanoids, and these could be, for instance, prostaglandin. Now, prostaglandin is very important for vasodilation, platelet inhibition, and also bronchodilation. In contrast to thromboxane, which is also produced from eicosanoid, which will have the opposite effect, so vasoconstriction and will lead to platelet aggregation. Now, because steroids such as cortisol are lipid soluble, they will diffuse through the lipid bilayer, and so they will have a receptor within the cell, and that's their mode of action. Now, we said that the endocrine system consists of a series of glands, the main gland or the master gland being the pituitary gland. So in the pituitary gland, which we'll talk about in a later video, we'll mention a few things here briefly. The main hormones it produces it consists of two compartments, one anterior compartment and one posterior compartment. The anterior compartment produces six main hormones, and these will be TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, which will be produced in the anterior compartment and then go to the thyroid gland to produce thyroxine and this thyroxine will regulate basic metabolic rate another hormone it produces is ACTH ACTH will act on the suprarenal or adrenal gland which is just above the kidney so this is the kidney this is the suprarenal gland and they are located here so you have two of them and ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone will produce will produce glucocorticoids such as cortisol which we mentioned before this cortisol would have anti-inflammatory effect and also regulate uh, glucose metabolism by glycogenolysis which is the breakdown of glycogen from the liver and also gluconeogenesis which is the formation of glucose so this will lead to hyperglycemia an anti-inflammatory effect why because it will decrease the production of pro-inflammatory proteins and increase the production of anti-inflammatory proteins. We'll talk about all of these hormones later on. FSH, which stands for follicular stimulating hormone, will stimulate the follicular growth in the ovary and spermatogenesis in the males. LH will lead to ovulation in females, obviously, and testosterone production in males. And growth hormone is very important for anabolic effects, so it's very important for growth. And so prolactin, which is the last hormone of the anterior pituitary gland, will lead to milk synthesis. Now in the posterior compartment, you will only have two hormones, and these will be ADH, which is important for water reabsorption in the collecting tubules of the kidneys. And then you have oxytocin, which is important during labor. So it will lead to uterine contractions, so to facilitate labor, and also it has a secondary effect with lactation. Now there are a few other glands, such as the pancreas, which produces insulin from its beta cell. Insulin has a key function in uh, uh, carbohydrate regulation. So it tells the liver and uh, muscle tissues and other tissues around the body to take up glucose. Uh, another gland is the parathyroid gland, which is located on the thyroid gland. Now, the parathyroid gland produces a hormone known as PTH, the parathyroid hormone, and this acts to increase calcium levels in the blood. This is in contrast to calcitonin, which is a hormone produced by the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, which acts to decrease this calcium concentration. Now, let's talk about feedback loops. Now, because it only takes a small amount of these hormones to alter the metabolic rates and metabolic processes of different tissues around the body, they will need to be strictly regulated. And so we have these feedback loops. Now, let's take an example with the thyroid gland. Now, the pituitary gland produced TSH, which then told the thyroid gland to produce thyroxine. Now, thyroxine, as you remember, altered the basic metabolic rate in a positive way. 
so to increase the basic metabolic rate this simply means that energy expenditure would be higher so if you would see a person with hyperthyroidism in which a lot of thyroxine is produced they would have a very skinny physique and the heart rate would be increased so how do you regulate this very potent hormone well too much of thyroxine will go to the hypothalamus as well as the pituitary gland to tell the hypothalamus to start producing trh which is needed for the production of tsh and it will tell the pituitary gland directly it will stop giving me more tsh because i don't need it there's too much of thyroxine and the opposite is true if there is too little of this hormone well then there is nothing to inhibit these two glands the hypothalamus would produce trh which would then go to the pituitary gland to produce tsh which then would go to the thyroid gland to tell the thyroid gland to produce thyroxine now i hope you really enjoyed this video and that you know a little more about the endocrine system and how it works remember this is just an introduction we'll talk in further detail about what all of these hormones do in the coming videos about the endocrine system now thank you for watching and I will see you in the coming videos.